thanks to the, uh, to the organisers of this event for inviting us in here to help celebrate the opening of this, uh, this wonderful new complex. And as always, we as Aboriginal people acknowledge the place where we're gathering. This area of land here is uh, the beginning point for the Kurilpa dreaming story. I understand somewhere in this complex they actually have the, uh, the Kurilpa dreaming story on, on walls or somewhere. The Kurilpa are little water rats and this point here is, uh, used to be a thriving colony of uh, Kurilpa and a very special gathering point for, for the, uh, the Aboriginal people of this area. It's come down here to perform ceremonies, rituals and the Kurilpa dreaming story would gather right the way down through to uh, the hill end. So as every time we, we come together in this place, we always acknowledge the custodians and keepers of those stories, the Jagara people, and their country goes right back up through the Brisbane Valley. And uh, it's always very important to respect those people who keep those stories, those ceremonies, those rituals. Uh, my contribution to this morning's program is a reading. Um, I was told that I could... Uh, I could read whatever I wanted to read, so my, uh, my favourite piece that I wrote quite a few years ago to commemorate a very sorry event, it was written uh, for my publishers Penguins who asked me to write a piece uh, that had an enormous impact on my life and changed the way I looked at things. And uh, to do that I wrote a piece about uh, the night that uh, a young nephew of mine Daniel Alfred Yock was, uh, was killed by Queensland Police in custody and this story is to honour his life and to remember the fact that he was killed in Queensland Police custody and that his family is still seeking justice at an end. It was the night they killed the song. Sunday the 7th of November 1993 was the night that life finally burned itself into my soul. One of my very special street kids became the latest statistic in the continuing tragedy of Aboriginal deaths in custody. Because that was the night that the young life of Daniel Alfred Yock came to an end. Mooney was only 18 years old when he died in the custody of Queensland Police. The same men and women who had sworn to protect him and keep him safe in a world of violence. I'd watched him from the first days when he'd come down to Sherberg, looking for something better. The mission had little to offer him, and like hundreds of others, he made his way to the bright lights, but they killed him. He may have danced like an eagle on wings of blue, but he died like a helpless moth on a stage of bitumen, blinded by lies and betrayed by others' failings. My nephew Robbie rang me from the public phone on the footpath outside the city watch house to tell me that Booney was dead. At that time I was living north of Brisbane in a farming community called Caboolture. It was an area rich in history, and the locals had told me often of their own family legends in which their grandparents had ridden out on the old hunts, killing blacks for Sunday afternoon sport. Our two-storey brick home in Smith Road was built on land that was drenched with the blood and suffering of the Cubby Cubby people. On that night in 1993, I was brutally reminded that the suffering of my people still continues. I told Robbie to wait. I was on the way. When I got there 38 minutes later, the police had already swung into damage control. On the footpath was our legal service group, two field officers and a solicitor, holding and comforting some of Booney's family. The police had not told them their boy's body was then at the hospital. He had been pronounced dead on arrival. The police were photographing the van in which Booney had died. That was important. They had to do it quickly, while the blood and sputum stains were still wet on the floor. They saw me, but they kept busy at their task. The wide inquiry was later told that at that, at that exact moment, Senior police had isolated all the officers who had been involved in the West End incident in which Mooney had been arrested. Those officers were in the hands of professional grief counsellors to assist them to cope with the trauma they were going through. Meanwhile, we waited at the fence, ignored and despised by those inside. I hadn't had much to do with coppers until I was a teenager, and my dad took me along to the Wollongaba Police Citizens Youth Club. The Gaba Police Boys Club quickly became an important stage in my young life. At the club, I'd learned to box, to play tennis, and to handle weight training. I'd also formed lasting friendships with a small group of community-minded police who gave up so much of their free time to run the club and all its activities. Even after I left school and started at the university, I still kept in touch. Like most other pressures, I joined in the, in the inevitable demonstrations and rallies with gay abandon. 
but I'm still able to say g'day to my old instructors and swap a yarn with them when I met them on the street. Why not? We were all Australians, it would, we'd once had some pretty good time together. Then in 1972, I joined the staff of the Brisbane Aboriginal Legal Service, and the world began to look different. As the one and only law clerk, I had handled the number one magistrate's court every morning. In that setting, my mob were the absolute victims and the police were the lords of the earth. One morning before court, one of my own blood aunties saw me talking to someone I'd met at the police boys club and she pulled me one side, very carefully. She told me that my erstwhile mate had pulled her off the south side one night and had raped her for three and a half hours. At the time, she'd been three months pregnant. She'd lost a baby. You watch him, boy, she told me. He's bad news, that fella. He hates all black fellas. 21 years later, I stood at the fence, choking on a level of hatred and anger that I'd never experienced before. I'm not a violent person. I'd always been the peacemaker and the cool head. About the only time that I ever really got mad was during the annual State of Origin series at Lang Park. Then I'd just be one of the mindless mobs screaming for blue blood. But this night was very different. We'd spent so many years trying desperately to use the legal service as a shield for our people, trying to give them some sort of transient sanctuary within the hallowed confines of the courts. But we consistently failed, frustrated and outsmarted by questionable police evidence. Even when the Royal Commission came along, we thought that things might change. We gave blind and unqualified support to that process and hoped. But on that night in November 1993, we wondered if the police officers who played an active part in the arrest and detention of Bernie had taken notice of any of the words that the commissioners handed down about how to treat Aborigines who are in their custody. During our preparation for the Wyville inquiry, we worked out that those police had breached 26 of the Royal Commission's recommendations. The word had come back from the hospital. It had been confirmed. Our boy was dead. The anger and hatred that was the living thing within all, all of us there at the watch house fence in the night air, now seemed to go cold. It was useless. We could not get it then at that moment. Far better to get our mob together in front than one time the next day. Our chant was a raw charge, spat from more than 200 black mouths as we marched on police headquarters. We had come together at midday the next day and after a quick sit down, we decided to march on the coppers and demand action. The police were caught by surprise. They must have thought that another death in custody was just in a day's work. It would be swept under the time honoured carpet with the other 99. No worries, just another boom bites the dust. One old uncle who had trouble keeping up with us because of his limp yelled threats of vengeance at the stunned sea of white faces on the footpath. We stormed down George Street, walking right in the middle of the road. As one, we are well beyond the social niceties. The coppers had rallied their forces and were massed in the foyer of the headquarters building in Roma Street. They put the biggest and meanest looking in the front rows, but if anything, that only offered much larger targets once the fight began. You come with us, Mungie, you'll help us talk to these mob police. The elder brother of Booty and the senior lawman of the Ock and Fogarty clan group asked me to walk with them inside the fortress. The police wanted to talk to a delegation. I would have rather stayed there on the steps with all our mob. We'd just been told by a friend that the infamous public order squad was assembled, fully armed and ready, down in the basement. If anything did start, there was a lot more room to move out in the open and a lot more backup. But this brother and I had been there before many times. I followed him inside. The coppers gave us nothing. We wanted the police to be involved in the arrest and detention of Booney, suspended and then charged. The top brass refused. Under the new post Fitzgerald system, this type of matter was now up to the Criminal Justice Commission. Any investigation would have to be its responsibility. We were informed by a ring of smug blue faces. I knew then that it was going to blow. It was just too much for far too long. Our people on the steps were just not going to wear it. By now, we were heavily outnumbered and the public order squad was deadly. We really had to get out of there and quickly. We could not afford to engage, not then. We were still angry to the point of possible homicide, but we had to be realistic. But two white men took the decision out of our hands. They were on the other side of the street and they must have been drunk or something because before anything else could be said or done, they threw drink cans at some Murray kids who were on our flanks. That was a spark. And all that anger, all that hatred, all that history of pain and suffering, it exploded right there in front of us. In that instant, the two white men thought they were dead. They saw the wall of black violence surging towards them and they bolted for their lives. Our front line cornered them in a baggage area of the transit centre 
and it was in that tight space that black men and men in blue came together. I thought that I'd suddenly be thrown into a Dandian slaughterhouse for the insane. The screams, surging bodies locked in death struggles, blood everywhere, children crying and bolting to safety. I began counting my legal service staff so I'd be able to start monitoring the inevitable arrests. But fortunately the word came through. The situation was far too volatile. There would be no arrests as long as the blacks cleared the area. It took only the more experienced police there on Roma Street a couple of minutes to work out that these blacks were different. These officers knew they were now confronting something produced by more than 200 years of brutal repression and that this generation of warrior men and warrior women literally had nothing to lose. Take the laughter of a child away from parents forever and those parents will have no real perception of what their own lives are worth if indeed they are worth anything. And deep down as well, I sincerely hope that the last some of these coppers we're feeling no good about Bernie. If we were going to have any future at all within this thinking white world, there must be some of those police who are angry or ashamed by what they've done to Bernie. The original two white men escaped. Some said they'd run straight into police headquarters and then disappeared into the offices. We were never able to confirm that. We managed to get our people back into the street and from there down to the forum area that was about 200 metres away, but I knew then the die had been cast. The Waka Waka Nation, buried Booney eight days later in the heart of their beautiful tribal lands. With all due ceremony and respect, they returned their song man to the earth. With him, all those black nations buried much of what history and colonisation had thrust upon our houses. In placing the dirt upon his coffin, we all said farewell to any useless last vestige of hope or innocence. Booney had carried within him ancient dreamings of songs that were now gone forever. Children yet unborn had been robbed. The cultural treasury of an entire generation had been breached and their riches obliterated. We also buried the great lie that is white Australia. During that time of our sorry business, we said goodbye to that popular myth of a peaceful, positive place of racial harmony. We would never again cringe from the hated blue uniform of the white boss. Booney may have been taken from us, but he also took much of the dross from this tragic land. It was then that we sealed our finest hour on the bitumen battlefield on Roma Street, November 8, 1993. We had stood again, stood as one against overwhelming odds, and with a single voice we had said, with power, with passion, no more Miglu, no more. Thank you.